Jen Nathan. I'd like to think about that more later. H is greater than or equal to J. That's actually interesting. Um, let's see. Can we process this? What's this saying? The ordered set is called directed when for every pair I and J there exists an H such that H is greater than I and H is greater than J. It's not saying that we can put I and J in order, though, is it? It's just saying that there's something that's bigger than There's a join. So, like, there's a trump. There's the biggest thing, right? There's like, there's an H. It's like trump. He's bigger. He's better. He's beyond them. So you can find trump in everything if you look for it. It's true. Very motivational. We're going to make math great again. We're going to make math bigger, better. I saw this thing, it was like... Uh, We're going to solve the Quintic. <laughs> Trump on uh, 2 plus 2, and it's like... 2 oh. plus 2. <laughs> oh, two I, plus two. we're going to be the best on 2 plus 2. It's like, you got these numbers. And you, we're going to maximize <laughs> what 2 plus 2 really is. <laughs> Most we can get on 2 plus 2. There's a comparison between Cruz's and Rubio's response. To Not this. only are we going to prove the Quintic, we're going to make the Mexicans do it for us. <laughs> Or the wall between psychology and math. <laughs> we're going to build a wall between psychology and math. Very nice. Um, <laughs> this Donald and Trump will make Oasis pay for Wonderwall. <laughs> Trump is going to make Oasis pay for Wonderwall. Well, that's that's a very cold musical grudge. I mean that that's that's decades in the making. I mean, how long ago was it that Oasis put out Wonderwall? I don't think it's that bad. There was a time when I took an international flight, and it was like the best song on the in-flight uh, <coughs> music, and that is a sad, sad commentary on that year. All right, <laughs> the set and it's like the height of Alanis Morissette's angst. Let's see here, um, the direct to set. Oh, the natural numbers with the usual ordering. Um, I mean, I think that's. He says you also could look at like a one. A2 da, 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 AN being less than or equal to B1, B2, da, 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 BN, if and only if what? AI less than or equal to BI for all I. This would be N to the N. Hello? Yeah. So, like, <coughs> those wouldn't necessarily, like, you could find two elements in n to the n that like are neither greater than or equal to nor less than or uh, like I'm just trying to think like if you had like one two and two one you wouldn't necessarily be able to order them without ordering but you would be able to find something that's bigger than both is that what it's saying? yeah I'm not sure because right I mean there were things like Right, there's like one, two, three, n, and then like what else? I mean, what else? Let's see, the thing that would be problematic would be what? Just two, one, yeah. three, four, yeah. and that's mm -hmm. not. You can't compare. You can't compare. Right? But you can't find something that's bigger than both. Right. Okay. So I guess the point is, I think what he's saying in a rather sort of compact, let's say, way, not meaning the technical sense of compact, concise way, concise. I have not seen concise used as a technical mathematical word yet. Don't be the generation that uses concise technically, please. <laughs> okay, um, it's probably already been done. Probably. <sighs> What's that? What would that even mean, like, for mathematical property? I don't know. I intend to use kryptonite in a technical sense sometime soon. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, so the point is, if you have two pairs, certainly you can find another pair, hmm. which you just take the max, and that will be the H, which is beyond both of them, even though you can't compare them. I think that's kind of the idea of this 
directed. It's, it's not. It's not an ordering, right? It's a. It's like a. Not. It's not an ordering, right? It's. It's something else. It's. Oh, it's an ordered well, set. It's an <laughs> ordering. It's, Come just, on. it's just not a total ordering. It's not a total ordering. Disgusting. All right. Um, Pinot. So this is what um, finite subsets of A with inclusion. The set. So the idea here is. Um, that's kind of the same way. You can find two sets that don't include each other, but you can find a set that includes them both, like the union, for example. Mm -hmm. Or we could just always use A. All right. But, yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm very lazy. Um, neighborhoods of points in the topological space? All right. All right, finally. All right, definitely. <clears throat> I see some co-final morphism. <laughs> Needless to say, make one of us happy. A map. The word if co and morphism appears in the same <laughs> definition. You know, it's where Nathan wants to be. Let's see your P. Going from J to I. Z between directed sets. Um, it's called a cofinal morphism. I love these termina. I love, I love abstract mathematical terminology. It's just. Oh, you know, actually, uh, I brought this with me today. <laughs> he's got. He's, a, he's a, in a woody, a woody carrying. Cofinal morphism. <laughs> a weed, a woody carrying. Carrying a uh, preserves category theorist. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what that makes you. Um, Need like a wallet edition. <laughs> if it Keep it in my wallet. <laughs> if, it <pres> <laughs> well, if it preserves orderings. So let's see here. P uh, J greater than or equal to P of J prime. If J is greater than or equal to J prime, and for every I, for every I in I, there is a J and J such that what? Row of Sorry, my P has become a row. P of J is greater than or equal to I. Example is the family of finite subsets inside a set A with even cardinality. Then, so he he what he's like? Oh, okay. So he's like basically you could look at even subsets, um, even numbered subsets of A, A finite set, and just do that into this guy in, by inclusion, you know, just in, include the subsets in there, then you still have, <coughs> if it's, um, <coughs> the inclusion is maintained under the, 
I mean, the containment follows under the under the inclusion, right? If it's an even sub, if you know, if you have one thing is a subset of here, then it's still a subset over here, and that implies that the uh, direction is maintained under the. This would just be the inclusion map usually. Sometimes people use like a Yoda, which is I just it frustrates me to write that. I just, I just it's all I can do. I just I can't help myself. I know it's not there, but it's just I feel better. All right. Oh, okay. I thought you were asking a question. Uh -huh. That would be actually strange if you raised your hand here. Um, definition. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, Nathan. <laughs> a net. Yay! In a topological space. Is what? Is a map. F, alright. Which goes from I into X. Where I is directed. So you remember what a sequence was. A sequence essentially is just a function from the natural numbers into a space. So what does that get for you? It gets for you the ordering of the natural numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Now, to make this talk proper, I really need an example where, this, where the convergence of the natural numbers is not enough. I don't have that example on hand, I'm sorry. wish I did, I just don't. Such examples exist, okay, because in particular you can't capture all topological concepts with sequences. There are simply things where sequences are not enough to capture various topological properties, okay? I'll take my word on it for the moment. But this notion of a net, you see it's a little bit it's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit better. We're just looking at maps from a directed set into the space. In particular, this includes sequence. Every sequence is a net. But not every net is a sequence. Because the notion of directed space is far more general than just countable things. Excuse me. Yeah, countable. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, and then here's, his, here's the definition of um, convergence in terms of nets. If, um, if X is a topological space, F is a net. All right. Um, and if X is a point in the topological space, all right, X is a point in X, one says one, the net F converges to X if for any neighborhood U of the family of neighborhoods of X, okay? This guy again, remember him? It's been a while. There he is again. Come back. If um, for any neighborhood U taken from the family of neighborhoods about x, there is an index i and i, right, such that f of j is an element of u for what? You felt like j greater than i or greater than equal to i. Yep. <clears throat> of course, this matches the definition of sequence if we replace the notion of a directed set just with the plain old notion of to what total ordering you said? Well ordering. Well ordering. Well ordering. <clears throat> doesn't seem like it. I mean why is this such a big difference I, I 
then 2, um, x is a limit point. The limit point of the net F. All right. If for any neighborhood, if for any neighborhood U of the family of neighborhoods of X, all right, um, and for any I and I. There exists a J which is greater than I such that what? It's a limit point of a sequence, what? If there exists some n such that everything beyond that particular point in the sequence is contained in some open set around the point right in the neighborhood, which applies the existence of an open set inside the point. So it's what? f of j is what? So he says, in a similar manner to what occurs <coughs> excuse me, with sequences, a converging net must converge to a limit point. Whilst a limit point <laughs> isn't necessarily a point to which a net converges in general. Lemma 6.60, if f is from x to i is a net, then x is a limit point for f if and only if there is a cofinal morphism P from J to I such that the net F composed with P from J to X converges to X. Let's see here. And then finally the um, proposition. Let me just state the finishing proposition here. Um, doo -doo. Then we'll be we'll go on to my brother's handout. <coughs> The proposition 6.61. So you have a, a, a subset of a topological a subspace, a subset in the space X for any X and X. All right. The following are equivalent requirements. It's five oh. o'clock. P.M. Quiet. There exists a net in A that converges to X two. There exists a net in A with limit point X. Three. The point X belongs to the closure of A. It all seems very much like things we've already done, but there's something that I should point out to you that should be shocking to you once you realize it. I never said anything about a metric. There is no metric here. This is all being done for an arbitrary topological space. And therein lies the difference. No use of metric. Completely use of this partial wool, whatever ordering. 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 And then theorem 6.62 tells us a topological space is compact if and only if every net has a limit point. So Compactness is equivalent to 
I don't know what the word is, but limits of nets. Every net having a limit point. It's the analog of every sequence having a conversion subsequence. And then he finishes off this section with a rather interesting example. Example 6.63. To get an idea of one of the possible applications of net, we outline the proof that every finite dimensional subspace of a topological vector space is closed. He's not assuming that the topological vector space itself is finite dimensional. He's doing this for an infinite dimensional vector space. But if you look at any finite dimensional subspace of that, it must be closed. And he, um, he sketches the argument here, which, which uses cofinal morphisms and nets and the rest. It's interesting. Page 127. All right, and then um, chapter 7, I just have a word or two about some things. Um, chapter 7, you know, he talks about subbases, Alexander's theorem, or, excuse, um, and that leads us to theorem 7.7 .7 in section 7.2, the theorem of Tikhonov. Tikhonov's theorem says the product of, arbitrary, of an arbitrary family of compact spaces is compact. So we had it for Wallace's theorem for, for, for two. And you can extend by induction for finitely many. This says that the basically arbitrary product of compact spaces is compact. That is a less easy theorem. When I took topology, we spent some time proving this, if I remember right. You get, well, it, actually, when you get to it, it's not that hard. Usually, you prove some other machine, and then you use that machine to hit this. But um, that's that. I probably have a few more words to say about paracompactness and, and some other things, but we'll talk about that more when we come back to the, to the, the, the start of um, abstract manifold theory some other day. Okay. So that brings us to my brother's um, <clears throat> handout, which we'll read together. So let's see here. I'll, let's start with his somewhat technical odds and ends one. We'll just kind of glance through that. So some of these, this is kind of a useful compendium of terms. Let's just kind of look through here, see the lay of the land. Once we're done with that, then we will look at the last and most hilarious handout. I was looking at this one waiting for it to be funny. Mm -hmm. like looking for puns. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not particularly funny. This is just, just, just Serious business. First countable. Second countable. Talk about that. All right. We've got separable means there's a dense set whose closure is x, right? x is said to be separable if it contains a countable dense set. For example, the rationals. So real separable. Um, Lindelof. Every open cover has a finite subcover. Our space is compact. If every countable open cover an open cover with countably many elements has a finite subcover, then our space is countably compact. If every open cover has a countable subcover, our space is Lindelof. Obviously, Lindelof plus countably compact. Right, I lost my place. Equals compact. All right. Also, every second every second countable space is Lindelof. All right. Theorem. T3 plus second countable implies T4. Alright, so he, dang it, he has not implied, he's not defined T4 here. Sure says. Ah, stink. That's seven section, section 7.6 in here. If you look at page 140 of Minetti, he gives us the rundown. Here's the distinction. Alright, listen carefully. T0, right, means that distinct points have distinct closures. That would be really disturbing. You have distinct points, right? But their closures overlap. That's messed up. That should never happen. T1, every point is closed. The idea of a point not being closed, I also find bothersome. T2, or Hausdorff. If distinct, we know that most well, right? Distinct points are contained in disjoint open sets. All right, we're used to that. T3, next level up, all right. 
if every closed set C and every point D not in the closed set are contained in the disjoint open sets. So you can disconnect if you have a closed set and you got a point not in the closed set, you can find open sets around the closed set and around the point which are disjoint and separate the closed set and the point. That's called T3. These are, called, these are collectively called separation axioms. T4, if two disjoint closed sets, C and D are contained in open disjoint sets. So in other words, if it's, it's T4, if whenever you have two closed sets, you can separate them with open sets which contain the closed sets and have disjoint. Finally, a space is called regular if it's T1 and T3. Um, okay, so there's some terminology. Now we can go back to the odds and ends here. T and three halves. Yes. Oh my goodness, yes. T3 plus second countable implies T4. Metrizable implies T4. Compact and Hausdorff implies T4. Well-ordered sets with the ordered topology are T4. Uriason's metrization theorem, T3 plus second countable implies metrizable. Uh, and embedding theorem, a space is T3 halves, yeah, if and only if it's homeomorphic to a subspace of the, the jth Cartesian product of the uh, closed interval from 0 to 1 for some j. Locally finite. Let x be a topological space and a is a subset of the power set of x. We say a is locally finite in x. If for every x point in x uh, there exists a neighborhood u of x such that u is disjoint from all but finitely many elements of A, uh, the family A. And then B is a subset of the, fam of the power set of X, said to be countably locally finite, or sigma locally finite if in, in X, if, if B, which is the uh, <coughs> countable union of the B sub n, where each B sub n is locally finite in X, this means B is the countable union of locally finite sets. What? <laughs> Each neighborhood is disjoint from all but finitely elements of A. That's weird. Oh, so you have this union that if you take a particular point, you only hit finitely many things in the cover. That kind of, that's, that seems interesting, yeah, sure. <coughs> Um, open refinement, he defines here, right? That paracompact, we'll talk about some other day. Um, locally metrizable, if x is, if, if every x, every point has a metrizable neighborhood. The nagata Smirnov metrization theorem. A space is metrizable if and only if it is T3 and has a countably local finite basis. Hausdorff plus paracompact implies T4. T3 plus Lindelof implies paracompact. The Schmirnov metrization theorem. Metrizable implies if and only if Hausdorff plus paracompact plus locally metrizable. And then bare space. Well, we talked about that already today. Let's see, what does he say? In Bayer's terminology, a set A is a first category if it's contained in the unable, union of countable, countable collection of closed sets having empty interiors. All other sets are of the second category. So a bare space is a space whose non-empty open sets are of all of the second category. Bayer's category theorem. A compact Hausdorff spaces are Bayer spaces. Also, complete metric spaces are Bayer spaces. That was the Bayer theorem we stated today, Bayer's category theorem. As you can see, there is this web of theorems that relate these things. We've only touched on some of these things, but you know, you could about go insane trying to uh, remember all these things. Just a handout bill of <coughs> topology. I, I enjoy it. I shall read. We now come to the seedy underbelly of topology. It's hard to believe in this day and age that there are those who still practice radical segregation, even advocate for it. In the time of Felix Hausdorff and Pavel Urison, this was accepted culturally but how such separation persists today is hard to understand. You see, topologists love to separate. They even have convinced themselves that it's regular or normal thing. Those are technical words. <laughs> I think normal is, I forget, one of those is T4, one of those is T3. It says right at the bottom. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we can begin to battle these prejudices, we must better understand them. Let us explore this despicable, let's explore this despicable list of axioms that we may effect a change and move towards a world which isn't T4 or T3, 
Maybe our children can grow up not knowing the horrors of Hausdorff spaces, quote unquote, and never have been inflicted with Uriason's innocent sounding dilemma. Stand up for what is right. Be the change you believe in. Uh, sorry, I'm just letting that sink in for a second. Did he write um, that or did he get this? Oh, this is his. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very proud of him for this. X is a topological, let X be a topological space. We say two points or more generally two sets are topologically distinguishable if there's an open set containing, containing, containing one but not the other. Right. So two sets are separated if, the, if one is disjoint from the other set's closure. So he, he goes on here to, of course, to, you know, explain what does it mean for sets to be separated. And, uh, Separate, sets are separated by continuous functions. If there's continuous function into the reals, which takes the value zero at every point in the first set, and one at every point in the second set. So A and B are separated by a continuous function, f, which goes from x from zero to one. If f is continuous, f of A is equal to zero for all A and A, and f of B is equal to one for all B and B. So notice that separated by a continuous function implies separated by open sets, since A is the inverse image of A is a subset of U, which is the inverse image of that and B is a subset of V, which is the inverse image of that, where U and V are open, since F is continuous, and disjoint, right? Hmm. So we know Hausdorff, regular, completely regular, normal, and then there, there they are, T0, T1, T2, T3, T3 half, and T4. Uh. And one of these, this, one of these things actually does, you can actually prove something interesting. I mean, but, um, I don't know. In some sense or another, all of these things were fighting to be the definition of various flavors and parts of these were trying to be wedged into the definition of topological space historically. So, I mean, one viewpoint is that as topology goes on and on, people will become less and less interested in this minutia. I'm sorry, but, you know, you, you want to study, I mean, you can try to, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it's important to understand all these different interrelations, and it may be for your graduate topology course. It's not particularly important to me, but that's just because I'm lazy. So, apparently, uh, T naught spaces are very important in computer science. Ah, Bill had one other comment, which I thought you would think is interesting. Bill said that, you know, compactness. Oh, we haven't even touched on ultra filters, by the way. Nets can be replaced with these things called ultra filters, and ultra filters. The ultra filter, for example, Bill was mentioning, there's this argument for Tikhonov's theorem, which is like not maybe like three or four lines using ultra filters. Whereas if you look at this, which doesn't use ultra filters, he mentions ultra filters in passing, like a page somewhere he says you could skip it in your first read, maybe even your second. That shows you his feeling about ultra filter filters, but they're powerful and they can be used to prove things. People who are really topologists are very interested in them. But they're also, Bill said, just as useful for logic, in particular for abstract, like the kind of logic you're interested in. And Bill said that filters and also compactness are really not even, I mean, yeah, they appear in topology, but maybe they're actually something beyond topology. They're really, the notion of compactness also appears in logic because there's this idea, right? You have infinite theories. You have infinitely many things that could be proved, right? But if you actually think about proofs, right? You're interested in proving finitely many things, like your proofs contain finitely many things. Well, that's compactness. That's like logical compactness, this idea that proofs are finite. Hmm. That's, a, that's a compactness. And that could be made more precise. That's not just a fuzzy comment. It's a fuzzy comment for me. It's not a fuzzy comment for somebody who knows things about, you know, abstract logic and such. But. What can I tell you? I live down in my lowly metric spaces, and <laughs> sometimes infinite topological spaces. That's about it. So, anyway, with that, so ends our study of Minetti. But I will try to suggest a few more problems for you guys, and then we'll go on to more fun things after break. Okay? You can get it off. I think.